Welcome everyone to section number four. This is Green's Theorem. And in this video, we want to go ahead and define a curve's orientation and go over the idea for the proof of Green's Theorem. And of course, I'm going to tell you what Green's Theorem is here. Okay, so Green's Theorem gives a relationship between double integrals and line integrals, which is rather remarkable, right? Because double integrals, you kind of think of this as, you know, adding up over a two-dimensional object. Line integrals is adding up over a, uh, a one-dimensional object. And actually, they have some relationship that you can actually make a trade, you know, for one in for another, uh, which is pretty remarkable. But it only works on simple closed curves. And so the big thing here, just a little bit of a reminder, right? We brought up this definition already, but simple closed curves, that means that they start and end at the same point, and they're not self-intersecting except for at the endpoints. Okay. So before we get to that, uh, there's one more definition that I need to give you guys, and that's for the curve's orientation. So a simple closed curve C has what's called positive orientation, If its parametrization transverses the curve exactly once in the counterclockwise direction. Oops, it's a horrible U. Counterclockwise direction. Okay. A simple closed curve has negative orientation. If its parametrization transverses the curve exactly once in the clockwise direction, as you would probably guess. Let's go ahead and draw a few pictures here. So we have this nice simple closed curve, something that looks like this. And if you parametrize it, right, you're going to start and stop at some point here. And if, as you're going around, you go in this counterclockwise direction, that means that you have positive orientation. If, however, maybe I'll draw a different uh, simple closed curve. Maybe I'll do a square or something like this. Right? This is simple closed curve. Okay. When we parametrize it, again, you're going to have a start and a stopping point, something like this. And if you go in the clockwise direction, this means that your curve has negative orientation. So it's going to matter which way we go around the curve, and so that's why we get these names, positive orientation and negative orientation, just to describe, are you going really counterclockwise or clockwise? All right, and with that, here is the definition, or I guess here's the theorem for Green's theorem. Let C be a positively oriented, right? So it matters we need to be going in this counterclockwise direction. Piecewise smooth, simple closed curve in the plane, let D be the region bounded by C. And if we have our nice vector field, which has two components, P and Q, and these things have continuous partial derivatives on an open region that contains D, then we can trade in the line integral, so P dx plus Q dy, and we can trade this, I guess this is over our curve C, for the double integral, over the region D, and here we need Q sub X minus P sub Y. So this is the partial derivative of Q with respect to X, the partial derivative of P with respect to Y, times DA for our double integral. Or equivalently, right, there's different ways that you can write these things. Maybe you instead you could say uh, the line integral of F dot T ds, so here's our unit tangent vector, here's our vector field f, right, dot d, sorry, ds, right, so this is another way to express the line integral, and if you'd like to, right, we can describe this, it's still, I mean, it's got to mean the same thing, but maybe instead of with the subscript notation, maybe you want the partial notation, so I should say the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y, right, and you can interchange these kind of as you want. Okay, the big thing here is that if you have your nice curve C that's positively oriented, right, so we're going to start and stop in the same spot, and we're heading in this counterclockwise direction. So this right here is C. Then the big thing here, the D, the region that you integrate over for your double integral, right, this is D is the region that's bounded by C. So D is this bit that's enclosed or bounded or 
whatever you'd like to use, that this area right here, this is D. So that's how C and D are chosen, right? They're related to each other. Okay, so again, this is rather remarkable, right? Why does this work? And so I'd like to talk to you about the idea of the proof a little bit. And this will come up again later here in chapter 16 when we talk about Stokes' theorem. But the main idea is circulation, right? So you can imagine kind of almost circulation. I mean, certainly you think about blood circulates or something like this. But I like to imagine even that you have kind of like wiffle balls or something like this on this line. And right, they may circulate, right? Maybe if the wind's strong enough or something like this, maybe the wind will push them in a certain direction, right? So you have this circulation. And so really, right, this right here, this line integral, this counts up how these particles on the curve are circulating. So let's imagine, I'm going to draw kind of a bigger picture here, just a piece of the curve, right? So there's more to this, and it does have to be closed and all that sort of stuff. But here's just a piece of it. In fact, maybe I'll draw the, the closed bit over here. Okay, I'll close it up just so that way. There's no confusion as you look at your notes later on. But if you're transversing this, right, in the counterclockwise direction, this would be counting up the circulation right, that's along the curve. And the idea here that Green's theorem says that instead of counting up how the particles are circulating on the curve, let's count up how the particles are accelerating, sorry, are circulating inside of the curve, right? And so the idea here is that we're going to break this up into lots of little pieces, which again, it kind of seems like we're at a adding complication to this, but the result is actually quite nice. So let's actually take a look at this. Let's break this curve up maybe. And if I do something like this, I'm going to break it up into lots of pieces. Like this, maybe I'll do a couple rows here. Something like this. All right. And of course, this would continue on uh, for the entire curve. Right, we're going to break it up into pieces. And so if I wanted to calculate out maybe the circulation on just this piece, right, going in this counterclockwise direction, and then maybe I'd come down here and over here and up here, right, this would be the circulation on just this one piece. Okay, but now let's do the piece maybe next to it. I'm going to use pink or so. So if I was to calculate out the circulation on this piece, notice that something nice happens here that kind of these two pieces right here, the pink piece and the purple piece, if you were to add these all together, right, once this line gets counted in the negative direction, and once it gets counted in the positive direction, up and down, right, and so these will perfectly cancel out. So when you add up the circulation on this piece and this piece, you get some cancellation, right? And likewise, if I was to maybe do the circulation on this piece, Right, so down, over, up, again, I'm going in this counterclockwise direction. You can see that once this curve gets counted you know, in the left direction, and once it gets counted in the right direction, so these will perfectly cancel out to these line integrals going in opposite directions. And so kind of when you keep doing this, I'm going to run out of colors, but when you keep doing this, maybe on this piece, you can see that there's a lot of cancellation. So far, we've canceled this piece. We've canceled this piece, we've canceled this piece, we've canceled this piece. And so when you add up the circulation for every single point or every single kind of these smaller regions inside, you start seeing that there's a lot of cancellation, that kind of any of these lines in the middle, these are going to end up canceling. And so the thing that you're going to have is just the bit on the curve left over. So this, again, the idea is instead of counting up the circulation on the curve, count up the circulation inside of the curve right kind of on each one of these smaller regions right and then the idea is that these will all cancel and it will give you the same result that the circulation will be the same circulation on the boundary versus the circulation inside of this region all right so that's the idea but it still doesn't help maybe where this quantity comes from and so we need to go through the proof in a little bit more detail but this is the idea right here so let's go ahead and do Green's theorem in a little bit more detail. So again, the idea is that if we add up the circulation for all the points on the curve, that this is somehow equal to adding up, right? So the sigma notation, adding up the circulation of all the points inside of the curve. So adding up the circulation for all the points on the curve, right? We're pretty familiar with this. That's just our line integral. 
So that's not in question. The big thing that we need to figure out, though, is what, does, what is a circulation at a specific point, right? So we need to determine what is circulation at a specific point. So in order to do this, we're going to do the old calculus idea here, right? So we're going to do circulation around a small rectangle, and then we're going to let those rectangles get very, very small, right? We're going to make their widths and their heights essentially go to zero. So again, we're doing this on very small rectangles. So I have the idea of the proof here. We're trying to do circulation at a specific point, so maybe right here. And we're going to do it instead you know, around a rectangle. So here's our point here, x, y. And again, kind of, we've broken up this nice curve. So this curve, which we're interested in, the circulation around the curve, this line integral. And we broke it up into lots and lots of little pieces. And we're going to calculate out the circulation on each one of those tiny little pieces. Right? And we're going to let those pieces get smaller and smaller and smaller, so they're basically points. All right, so let's look at this here. We have a small rectangle, and I want to calculate out the circulation on that small rectangle. Well, the small rectangle is built out of the four pieces, right? We have the top, we have the bottom, we have the left and the right. And so we need to calculate out the circulation, right, on each one of those pieces. Well, let's just look at the bottom for right now, right? So the bottom, right, so we're moving in this counterclockwise direction. So we're circulating, right, to the right here. So that's in the I direction, right? So we're going to use our vector field F at the point X, Y. And we're circulating, right? We're moving in this I direction. So that's our F dot T, really, right here. F dot T, right? So T, our tangent vector, our unit tangent vector, is going in that I direction. OK, and what point are we at? Well, technically, we're moving along this bottom, but we can imagine that we're kind of, uh, we're, we can a constant make this, bleh, sorry there. Uh, we can make this, or we can consider as if we were at the point x, y, because again, this is a very small rectangle, so we're not going to be changing very much. This is really where this continuity comes into play. It kind of guarantees that we're not making these big jumps. So I'm just going to consider that we're at the point x, y here. So again, we're looking at the bottom. We have this f dot t. So again, here's our f. Here's our t, and what's our ds, right? We need to add up kind of along this entire curve. Well, it has a width of delta x. So our ds, our tiny step along the curve, well, we took a step that was delta x long, right? And so if we were to evaluate this out, i dot f, i dot f, well, this is just the first component, right? When you take the i dot, this is really 1, 0. So when you take the dot product along with this, you just get the first component of f. f is made out of p's and q's, right? So therefore, this is what you get when you evaluate along the bottom. Now likewise, let's go ahead and consider uh, moving along the right-hand side, and then I'll let you think about the rest. So when you're moving along the right-hand side, right, you're moving in the J direction. It's up and down, right? So you take a step in the positive direction. How big was your step? What was that DS, right? Well, it was delta Y, however big uh, that Y value is that changes here. And so you take that and you dot product it along with f, and then here, right, we're kind of imagining that you're at this point right here. And so when you take that dot product, again, when you dot f with j, you just get the second component, right, p, q. So you get q of x plus delta x comma y times delta y. All right, so these are approximations for the line integral along each one of these pieces, right? So we have to do all four of them, and you should look at the top and the left-hand side to make sure you're reasonably happy with this. But then we're going to go ahead and group these things, right? So if I want to do the circulation along the entire, right, this is a tiny rectangle. So that's why I have here it's circulation along kind of this tiny rectangle. Well, you would have to move across the top, the bottom, the left, and the right. And so, okay, if we add these all together, you get something like this, which, oh my goodness, it's making my eyes hurt, right? But we can go ahead and group these things together, right? Maybe all the stuff with P's, notice they both have this delta X that you could factor out, all the stuff with Q's, and maybe if you really want these things to communicate with each other, let's go ahead, right, this has delta X's, delta X's, let's put a delta Y here. So this is where this delta Y comes from, but of course, if you put one at the top, you also have to put it in the bottom. And likewise, here we have delta y's. Let's go ahead and do delta x's, right? And you can see now that this quantity, I'm going to highlight it here, this quantity, this looks kind of like a partial derivative, right? It looks familiar to us, 
right, where this H, this tiny change, right, is happening in this Y component. Imagine that these were kind of H's here. Uh, let's see, sorry, I didn't mean to highlight that one. There we go. Right, a tiny change, this delta Y. And likewise, these, you can imagine they're H's. Okay, so that means that these really are partial derivatives with respect to Y and with respect to X. So this right here is very close to a partial derivative of P with respect to Y. Right, but normally it would be positive P of X, Y plus H minus P of X, Y. Right, and so the minus signs are flipped here. And so that's why it's negative P of Y. And likewise, here we have Q sub X, right? So this one actually is in the right order here. So Q of X plus H comma Y minus Q of X, Y all over H, right? As H gets very, very small, as delta X gets very, very small, you should be thinking about that this is going to be like the partial derivative of Q with respect to X. So this is the circulation around that rectangle, but now we need to scale it down to circulation at a specific point, right? Rectangles, they have widths and they have heights, right? And so in order to get circulation at a point, let's go ahead and divide by the area of that rectangle. So in this case, the area of the rectangle is going to be, well, delta y, delta x. And so therefore, the circulation at a specific point is going to be equal to q sub x minus p sub y, or that is the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y. And that is why Green's theorem is the way it is, right? That's why when you have trading in circulation for the points on the curve with the circulation for the points inside the curve, well, circulation at a specific point is given by this Q sub X minus P sub Y. And so if you add them all up, Right? If you take this double integral of the Q sub X minus P sub Y sort of deal, this will give you the circulation on the entire curve. That is the line integral of P dx plus Q dy. All right, so again, that's why Green's theorem is the way it is. That's why it works in class. We're going to utilize it a bunch. We're going to solve a lot of problems now that we've seen the proof. All right, I'll see you then.